Hello, everybody. Hello. I can hear myself now. It's good. Hi, John. Hello, and and uh, we have also a guest, Shahedan, Hello. Who's been who has been a regular lately because I feature him every uh, community link section. So I figure, why not just have him show up in person? Oh well, <laughs> I'm going to have to be on my best behavior here in the studio. Yeah. Then it's been a while since I've been on. It has been a while. You had some vacation, huh? Oh yeah, I mean I did. I mean it was a couple of weeks there. I was on vacation this summer, and then it was just stuff busy other stuff going on so there is that cool. oh facebook chat i can see up here now too the studio is working pretty well i have to say i know yeah we've been uh you know um james montemagno has been in there fiddling around and we do the tuesday thursday show every week so we've yeah. been just owning the system and so Excellent. yeah good stuff so john yeah. you love the community so much at this time you brought it with you <laughs> i and, sure did yeah and so, yep. <laughs> but i'm assuming you have some community links I do have it. some links. Well, Let's I believe right I, I heard that Mr. Hanson will be joining us uh, at some time during the show as well. So we'll see That's how the that, we'll Like see right how that now. Goes. Like and right there now! Is. There he is! I can't see him. I can only uh, hear him. Because we've already, uh, John's showing his screen. So we'll say hello yeah. to you oh. when you... Okay, I'm not really here. Okay. <laughs> all right, John, awesome. you're on, man. Cool, cool. All right. So first of all, um, last week I briefly mentioned uh, the HTTP REPL and pointed out the, the docs thing. Here there's an official post uh, about it. So just kind of going through the, the HTTP REPL. So this is on the ASP.NET blog. Um, the docs go through kind of in more detail. Um, this is neat. Um, one, one thing that, that Angelos is doing in addition is showing setting it up um, in Visual Studio Code and in Visual Studio, so as a tool. So pretty cool. This is neat. I don't know how many people know about this, that you can set up in Visual Studio a custom browser. So if you say browse with HTTP REPL, um, you can start up, you can have your site run directly. Yeah, as that. he points out there too, our goal is to kind of get this to be the default experience for API applications and just to make this more first class. So once the REPL is kind of bedded down, um, we would love to get it just in by default for Visual Studio as a first class option for these API style apps where you don't have a UI as such. So for now you can do this workaround. It has a couple of little things that don't work perfectly, but it works well enough you know, to set it up yourself. Um, but this is just the beginning. So please people try it out. I think like, I checked yesterday, there were only like 500 downloads of the tool, you know, which isn't, which isn't nothing, but we have like 50,000 users in July who tried out .NET Core 3, which is a phenomenal number by the way. So I want to say thank you to everyone as my little tangent here for trying out the preview of .NET Core 3 um, because we've never had penetration numbers like that. It's, it's absolutely fantastic. We're getting that much feedback. Um, so yeah, go and try the HTTP REPL and give us feedback. I had a question on the chat. Kyle's asking if it support HTTP, HTTP2 or gRPC or any of that kind of modern stuff. So I think stuff. HTTP2 will just work. Like you don't really get any, you don't really utilize HTTP2 from your HTTP APIs, right? Like you don't get mm -hmm. access to right, the man. kind of, it's all under the, in the transport layer. gRPC is different. gRPC is built on top of HTTP2 primitives. And so you need HTTP2 uh, to sort of get the full benefits of gRPC. This tool does not yet support gRPC, but we have had extremely early discussions about wouldn't it be great to have a similar experience for gRPC. Um, I don't know whether it will be this tool that gets updated to support gRPC or whether we'll do a different tool um, or whatever it is, but this whole idea of having either a command line REPL or something like Postman um, or you know the, the Chrome Dev tools or something like that available to you for gRPC is something that we are keen on and we're sort of currently looking at the landscape to see what's already out there. There's a couple of things. They're not particularly great from what I hear. Um, so there is an opportunity to do something there and we'll see how we go. Cool. All right. And then just a, another call out. We're trying to be more conscious of they're, they're doing some great stuff with Visual Studio for Mac lately. And so th that's also in here showing how to set that up as a custom tool. Excellent. Yeah, uh, Gunnar Pipeman here, he's writing up. This is an interesting uh, thing. I've, I haven't done this for quite some time. This is setting up vCard support in ASP.NET Core. Um, so just kind of, you know, custom action result. Um, you know, this has been a feature in in MVC for a long time. So this is a neat, you know, there, there's just a published standard for vCard. And so this allows just downloading, you know, the vCard in in the controller. So, so to, there's a couple to, different to ways. To be clear. Yeah. This, this is for like if I visit a site and I want to have a contact show up in Outlook. Or right. on your phone or whatever it might be. So I, exactly. I do something very similar on live.asp.net. So the, the yep. add to Outlook or download iCal. iCal um, that I implement. Uh, it's well, it's not there because it's yeah. live right now. Yeah, um, yeah. 
but you can look at the source code on GitHub. Um, that is rather than doing it as a custom action result, I actually do it as a formatter. Um, so there's, there's a couple uh, of different ways you could do it. Um, but right. Yeah. Cool, cool. All right. Uh, here, this is uh, Ed is writing about using code behind approach to Blazor components. So usually with Blazor components, a lot of you know a lot of things will show the kind of single file approach. Uh, you mean logic, everything? Right? Everything will show yes. the single file approach. Y yep, yep. And you know, over time, you'll want to. A lot of time, you'll want to kind of organize things better. Um, I don't know. I kind of like <laughs> generally. Yeah, I, I would avoid using behind. terms like better. And just just to, just lean into the fact that this is completely personal choice. Yeah. And the reality is that the rest of the ecosystem, the rest of the ecosystem for component-based frameworks like the Spa world has all kind of gone to single file. That that, uh, that was the big okay. innovation, right? Was that they mixed yeah, yeah. like T JSX and TSX and those other types of templating. Was they went back to putting everything into one file, but they make it testable, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and yeah, Razor's had that forever, but it wasn't particularly testable because of the way the view was compiled, it was compiled into a separate assembly, it depended on your application, it was done at runtime, so you couldn't even get it at unit test time, so it was never really you know, very conducive to that. But uh, this is very different. So um, whereas in Razor Pages, we still have a code behind approach by default because it still compiles using the Razor view style where the, the, the CSHTML is compiled into a separate view. You don't t generally test that, you test the um, page model or the view model. Mm -hmm. Um, the Blazor model isn't really MVVM, right? It's more the model view update style uh, of, of UI paradigm. And so you can test, you know, the view in air quotes directly um, because it produces a class and you can just reference that class. You can create a class library that has all the compiled stuff in it and you can reference it and, you know, you're off to the party. There's, all, there's no HTTP or anything like that you have to mock out. It's just a class that has events and methods and you call it. So, I mean, it's not... Out of the box, I won't claim that it's fully testable. There are some discussions going on right now about the best approach, just like forever. There will be forever and everything we do. Um, but mm -hmm. it's all opinions and stuff. So, yeah, I mean, you can do, yeah. we wanted to make sure you can do code behind or code beside or whatever you want to call it, because there are some people who prefer it. Um, and there's a couple of different ways of going about it right now. I think some people are waiting for the partial class support, unless we, did we land that already? Is partial class supported in Blazor components yet, or did that not land yet? I, I don't remember. know. So this one, I think, is this one using the base inheritance model? Uh, yes. Yeah, okay. Which you can do in all of Razor. Um, yeah. But there was also, for a while, we were looking at doing partial class support for Blazor or Razor components as well. And I'm not sure if that got cut from 3.0 due to time or whether it's still coming or whatever the case may be. I just lost track of that one. Cool. All right. So, uh, all right. This is a nice post from Anthony Chu. So this is you know, in depth looking at ions async enumerable of type TN .NET Core 3. So this, he goes kind of all up, but then towards the end, he does dig into why it's also a nice feature in ASP.NET Core 3. So mm. he shows an example here. So yeah, so showing, you know, uh, with preview seven, being able to return from a API controller action. Um, so, you know, you can return your method result directly. Yeah, you, go, you have to right be a little then. careful about those type of things. Um, like he, he, he's making a claim there that you're effectively streaming data from the database to the HTTP response. Um, it's never that simple. Mm -hmm. <laughs> In gRPC, that's true because gRPC supports duplex streaming as a protocol. HTTP, like REST doesn't really in that sense. Like you kind of expect the entire response to come back before the client starts re actually processing the response. I mean, HTML is different. Like the browser can start obviously rendering while the HTML is still streaming. And there's a whole a science around constructing the HTML response in order to best allow the browser to do that. But for REST mm -hmm. style, like JSON, you don't even know it's valid JSON until you get the last byte, right? You can assume right. it is on the way, but you don't really know. Um, and there's, so there's a new, uh, by the way, that showed me, that, or I, I recently saw, there's a JSON binds. Um, spec or, or something. Basically, somebody created a streaming JSON okay. format. So, I mean, it, it's I mean, not that it's not possible. It's just, it's not yeah. really idiomatic. It's not widespread. And certainly right. by default, this is not what this is doing, right? You know, like yeah. returning icing. Mean, what happens behind the scenes here is we will um, do the await for you on the enumerable from the layer before the action result, right? And so instead of you having to do the two list yourself, we will do it for you and we will release the thread 
um, and return it. And you know, we will do the right thing in the sense, but we're yeah. not. We won't be buff. We won't be sending the responses back to the client in a way that the client could really utilize each record as it comes down. I'd love for us to get there, but that requires the client and the server to really agree on what's going on. And to my knowledge, that's not something we can kind of just do out of the box and it works everywhere. So what will happen behind the scenes, we may actually end up buffering as well. So you might see that uh, if you do this and you have a large result set that we have to buffer because we don't want to just eat memory forever until um, we can send the result back. Um, and so you might see we start reading, to, we might even start writing to disk and all that. So you have to be aware of what's going on behind the scenes, that one layer of abstraction more, as, as Hanselman always goes on about, to really understand what's going on here. This looks very simple, but it is not streaming as such. Okay, cool. Um, and like, I guess part of my takeaway from that is by using this in my code, this enables you to kind of optimize things in the stack. So things get better over time for me in the same way, like yes. that span of T kind of rolled into it. So my strings just got faster. And yeah. Stuff. And so like, to be, to be really clear, it would be really crappy if we had shipped .NET Core 3 or if we shipped .NET Core 3 which has C Sharp 8, which supports this new idiom, this new primitive, and then MVC either just like throws an exception if you try and return it, or worse, it does something you don't expect. Like it's it tries to serialize the entire I async enumerable structure rather than going, oh, this is an enumerable object. I need to like iterate over it. And then those are the objects I want to return and run through the formatter pipeline, right? That would have been bad. Um, and so we had to do something, but there's only so much we can do given the constructs available in MVC and over HTTP and what people kind of expect by default out of the box. There is more we could do, but it would require a lot more work and design and thought. And like I said, the other side would probably have to agree. Cool. Yeah. Okay. All right. Uh, big post from Nick Craver, who is on Twitch, which is fun to see. Uh, so here he's talking about how they do app caching in Stack Overflow. There is a lot here. So there's, the, you know, of course, the Redis caching. Um, and uh, he talks about currently, you know, the current state, uh, this is running with .NET Framework. Um, they are working towards, you know, the big kind of update to .NET Core 3. So he does mention that kind of towards the end in this. Uh, but just just a lot to look at. Um, part of with all of this is, you know, looking at the effects. So over time, there's kind of best guesses at how the caching works, and then they're profiling in depth to see how it's actually turning out. So uh, so for instance, um, uh, towards the end, I mean, there's, there's quite a bit here. Um, there's uh, some things that he talked about with like, for instance, optimizing, so calling get set together uh, so that you're not continually refetching things um, and, and, you know, optimizing quite a bit of, of stuff. Uh, so just some things I wanted to point out. And again, this is a grab grab a couple of cups of coffee and spend some time with it. But uh, talking about cache performance, using mini profiler, of course, um, using the, the Stack Exchange Redis profiling API. And uh, then some fun stories in here too as well. Um, so looking at some some things that that worked and didn't work uh, as they were kind of going through all this. So um, so accidentally not using cache, setting long setting incorrect cache times. So time span sixty is not sixty seconds; it's sixty ticks. Um, so a lot of kind of fun stuff there. Um, so yeah, definitely definitely a good post. All right, exciting one to wrap up with here is uh, Shahed's post at the end of his 26 series. So he did, last year, he did an A through Z series. Um, this, uh, or excuse me, last year he did a, a Happy New Year uh, thing uh, where each letter spelled out Happy New Year. So that was fun. This year he's he's written 26 posts, uh, A through Z, and we've been featuring quite a lot of them. So I, I figured, why don't we just get your head on the show? Um, so. I am actually, how do I, I can't seem to get myself to, there it is. <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing my screen. We'll pop over to uh, to the folks All right. here. All yeah. right, yeah. <laughs> All right, hey. are we live? <laughs> yeah. We are live. Yeah. So I'm sharing my whole desktop here, so hopefully I have uh, nothing too crazy open. And sometimes people freak out when they see the size of my taskbar, so don't be alarmed. I just have a lot of icons down there. You will be judged. 
Uh -oh. oh, I'm already judging you. I just set up a website. I bought the domain. You have two. You have a double layer taskbar. I thought it was I have three. A no, it's a triple layer yeah. taskbar. Yeah. Oh. I, I like to see a lot of stuff. Uh, so yes, yeah, as, as John was saying, I, I started out. Uh, I just wanted to pick out some topics that uh, I could uh, share with the world, but at the same time, not go out of date, uh, like many of us have done. We've worked on some books in the past. I did one in ASP.NET Core 1.0. Uh, as soon as it came out, 1.1 was right around the corner, tools had changed. So I thought, why not just work on something that I can update over time? And so it's always relevant. And when I'm done with the series, update it again. So this is a living, breathing series of blog posts uh, with every topic you can imagine around ASP.NET Core. So from uh, authentication down to uh, deployment to Azure, getting zero downtime. Uh, I know John wanted me to share some stats on it as well. So if I share the screen, can you guys see my uh, slideshow here? Yeah. All right. And I'll do some demos as well. Uh, so it led up to this being the series. Uh, but I was looking at uh, what are people interested in? What do they like to read? So I see that over time, when I first started the series, I had like next to no views at all, 2,000 or less views uh, every month. And then you see right now, the latest month, the highest one is up to uh, 65,000. And, and there's also a bunch of spikes there. So look back at what do people like? What are people interested in? And all these spikes are related to major announcements. So back in December 2018, we had a spike with uh, Connect uh, 2018 coming out. A lot of new announcements around .NET Core 3.0, uh, closer to April, where we had the big VS 2019 launch. Uh, again, these are few and far between because you have all the big events, but the new IDE release uh, usually doesn't get a launch event so often. So again, this one uh, garnered a lot of interest and also C-sharp 8 uh, information in there got a lot of interest as well. And finally, as I saw at the end of the book release. So looking back at what people like to search for, uh, the authentication post being the first one uh, just happened to be the most popular one as, as of now, uh, because people have been seeing it for a while for the past six months. Our uh, production tips, although this is a more recent post, a lot of people love that because once you're done developing your ASP.NET Core app, you want to deploy it somewhere. How do you get it out there? What are some tips and tricks? Uh, logging, again, something that's important after your app is out. Uh, highlight it number four and five because these are just the, the index page and the home page. So they could be looking at whatever is current right now or just browsing through the series. Uh, the second half also shows you additional things around what people uh, are reading around .NET Core 3.0. I know we heard some stats earlier, massive number of downloads, more people getting interested. Uh, and these are specific to forms and fields. Uh, like as soon as you're building a web app, you need to know, you know how to put everything together, obviously. And then not to be forgotten, Blazor. So a lot of people are looking at Blazor and uh, I built a word cloud around this. This was interesting. Uh, so this is a little Pac-Man shape. I used a word cloud generator. You'll see people are searching for ASP.NET and core but also down here on the left, I found Blazor with uh, Blazor Z-E-R. Now, I haven't misspelled it myself on my <laughs> site, but people are searching for it. So this is important. So maybe I should have a keyword in there somewhere. So somehow they're ending up on my site. Maybe Google or Bing corrects it. Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, so yeah, it's good to see that they're searching for all these different words. There's stuff on cookies and consent. Uh, there's sample tutorials, uh, handling errors, key vault. Uh, again, cookies down here, Azure Storage. Azure is really big. Uh, you know, people want to be able to deploy really to any platform because .NET Core is cross-platform. Uh, but again, they're looking at uh, Azure as well. So yeah, it's great to see. Uh, any feedback, insights on any of the search terms? It all looks pretty in line with what we see for the search terms for our own content as well. Yep. Do you get um, common questions or you know, like comments where people are searching based on some sort of problems they're having or uh yeah so the around the problems that they're having it could be something that uh worked for them uh or, or didn't work for them based on the version number that they're using and uh a, a lot of the time they're looking at the latest version and the there are a lot of the documentation that's out there are from different versions so i see that people are uh looking for something that works for them at the moment uh, and this is not for any specific topic, but because sometimes dependencies change and just the way you're doing something changes. Like my Blazor post was uh, a while, it was uh, back, it was a second post, right, back in January. So a lot has changed since then. So the demo that we'll see shortly is around Blazor, the way things were done. As you know, well, Blazor's been changing a lot. 
Uh, so uh, the comments were, uh, some of the comments I got were, hey, this is great for this version, but this other version, this one is, isn't working for me. So uh, again, that's a really nice prompt from the community saying, hey, this is something you should look back and change. And that was the goal of doing you know, a blog series based on uh, things that are rapidly changing to be able to gather comments because I might not mm -hmm. know what's broken, but uh, this allows me to always collect feedback uh, and be able to fix things uh, so that it's useful to everyone else who's also watching. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's always a problem, right? Was when you find a blog post and it's like for three previews back and semantics change and the code doesn't work. So so I, I definitely appreciate that, that you keep things up to date. And that's a, that's a cool system, by the way. I hope you, you'll show that also, the, the, the way that you're regenerating stuff. So you're yes. updating them and then you're building this ebook out Yep, and that's done, done yeah. with, uh, so it's done with a worker service. This is really, uh, as you can, super simple code. I literally have a string of URLs. So this could be something that you'd uh, extract out and stick it into a JSON file or just a text file. And uh, when I run this, I would literally just hit the play button and I hope this works. Because yesterday I had to update my Nougat dependencies. Uh, mm -hmm. It's on preview seven right now. And all it literally does, it goes out, pulls out a file. I'm going to zoom in a little so people can see on the screen. So it's just processing one by one. And what it does is it literally spits out all of these Word documents. And this is really interesting because I'm using a third-party package to generate a Word document. And if any of you have ever automatically generated Word documents from web pages, you know that it's not always perfect. Uh, so the first thing I noticed was I have the grids turned on over here uh, to make sure that uh, I see where things are aligned. So let me go ahead and open one of the other files. So the intro here was actually written by our very own John Galloway. Um, so this one over here, as you can see, it's generating uh, pretty good formatted files, but uh, what happens is all the images are a little messed up. So initially, the first way I was able to fix this is this is super painful. I had to manually click that, uh, but we're able to automate it by adding a macro. Now, I didn't publish the macro version, uh, because I don't want to put, you know, publish Word docs with macros in them. But the end result is a very nice uh, PDF. So it has this single page, it has the intro by John, and then all the code samples are formatted. Uh, and they're all a single color right now. Uh, but yeah, this is all generated with the worker service. Everything is, if I go back to my worker service site, um, everything is uh, open source, as is uh, all the samples. There you go. So a very simple worker service, and all it generates is uh, the whole bunch of chapters. But if I go back to the Blazor example right here, again, you've seen a bunch of examples before. Uh, this is a, a very simple dice roller app, sort of like uh, Yahtzee. Uh, so what you do is when you click on reset the dice, it's just making a one, two, three, four, five, six. I can go ahead and roll the dice, make it something different. Again, part of the demo, if you look at uh, the sample code that I have, uh, it's automatically generating uh, all these files on the client side, not unlike the demos we've seen before. So again, not uh, not something uh, that's too different from other examples we've seen. But I also look at examples again. SignalR is something that was added uh, quite late to the game uh, in Signal in uh, ASP.NET Core, and uh, once it was on the horizon, I started telling a lot of people, "Hey, SignalR is out. This is something really cool. You can start using it right now." And I noticed that the community responded, like there was very positive response around not only the maturity of .NET Core, but around things being added that they were familiar with before. So it's super cool to have this. Uh, this is a live poll right now. I'm going to zoom in to this URL. Uh, I don't know if you can you guys see that URL right there? Yeah. All right. So it's live in marvelpoll.azurewebsites.net. Uh, so I will go ahead and uh, leave that. So there you go. John Galloway voted for I am the captain now. So I can go ahead and vote <laughs> for that. Uh, so you can do anonymous voting. If I put my name shy, then there I can vote for Captain America. And I can sort of cheat because I'm not blocking anything. Uh, but the goal of this is to show that, you know, again, you can use SignalR for a lot of different cool things, including uh, live demos, um, but also capture that data however you wish to, right? And uh, in case you're wondering how this little tiny icon is generated, so it's not a broken icon. That's literally the Unicode character for a black square. So again, just a placeholder uh, that does that. And I see Scott Hanselman likes uh, Captain Marvel, but uh, I am the captain now is winning. So there you go. So those, <laughs> <laughs> so those were the three demos that I wanted to show today. I know uh, you can so, just hold down the enter key there to, uh, to load test uh, your server. Damon figured it out. There you <laughs> <Yeah>. go. <laughs>
<laughs> Good stuff. Wow. So as you were writing this book, uh, what were some of the things that you found most interesting that you were, that you learned, you know, that you kind of dug into and was, it was a surprising new discovery. Uh, so one of the things I realized again, that everything's always changing, but also, uh, how many things there are to learn about ASP.NET Core, which I guess will be ASP.NET 5 going forward. No, that's yet to be determined. Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, so I won't, I won't say anything that's not official. Uh, <laughs> no, no, so... You can say whatever you like. I'll just, I'll just clarify. <laughs> all right. Uh, so, yeah. So one thing I realized things were changing in, well, people would ask me all the time, well, uh, why should I learn all this new stuff? It's always changing. And I don't want to watch all these videos, read all these docs. So the first thing I wanted to do is, uh, sort of counter that by referring to all the official stuff. So one thing you'll see I have in common all the posts is that I refer to the official documentation wherever it's relevant. If there's a new video that's out, I'll embed that video and comment on it as well. I'll watch the whole video, pick up some highlights, and then mention those and attribute it to quotes. I'll put tweets on there as well from official tweets that are out. Uh, so that way it's all interconnected, right? There's new announcements, everything that's coming out. And I'm able to uh, get all the information so that a reader wouldn't have to go seek out everything on their own. But at the same time, they're not left to just reading this uh, isolated set of blog posts because everything is connected and they can go back to the source. Cool. Uh, let me see. I'm watching for questions. Um, mostly people are just saying this is awesome. <laughs> Some people all liked right. your font on the word cloud. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That was cool. Uh, let me see. I'm trying to think of anything. Any uh, any comments or, or questions um, from Scott or Damien? Oh, it's super cool to see. Obviously, <laughs> I think I think these type of things are probably particularly useful for a lot of folks um, for the reasons that were pointed out. Um, I think it's always difficult to keep up with stuff. I mean, that's just our industry in general. Though I've been in this industry twenty years and. You, mm -hmm. you, everyone has their way of doing stuff. I mean, some people kind of actively just avoid it, and I've never quite understood that. And they just complain about the fact that it always changes. It's like, well, <laughs> I, I don't know what you expected in an mm -hmm. industry like this. Like, you have to put some effort into continual learning um, and having a really good filter. Just you know, learning enough about something to go, yeah, this isn't particularly useful or interesting to me or applicable, and I'm just gonna, uh, you know, let it pass me by. And yeah, you know, Hansman talks about drinking from the fire hose. Um, you know, with regards to Twitter and a bunch of other stuff, and this is no different in my mind. Um, the, the, the language stuff in particular that is the stuff that I've historically probably had the most struggle with adopting. Um, I remember even way back when .NET 2 came out, generics and the new C-sharp features and your lambdas and all the stuff that was the, in there as the precursor to, to for link support that came later. And I was not a computer scientist person at all. I was you know, very much a script-based web developer and I just thought all that stuff was complete nonsense and why would you ever need generics? I remember getting some code from someone um, which used generics to abstract a custom list class. And I was like, oh, is this so over-engineered? You don't need any of this stuff, right? And then you know, obviously over time you go, oh, no, actually this is actually kind of useful. And I, I, there is a part of my brain, I admit, that still has that knee-jerk reaction to a lot of new things. And you just have to actively, you know, I've had to learn to actively kind of push against it and just lean in. Like even looking at all the new C Sharp 8 stuff, there's a lot of stuff. And knowing when to um, use it as the new default when you're writing new code or when it's worth to go back and retrofit new um, features into existing code because there is some tangible benefit, um, whether it's maintenance or performance or you know, whatever it might be. Um, interoperability, then you know that's just a skill that we all need to to develop, and is not a skill that all you know doesn't just call, you know calling it a skill doesn't mean that there's always a right answer that is applicable everywhere. And you know mm -hmm. Nick always publicly talks about trade offs, and I always love that. And we we live trade offs on our team because you know we serve millions of customers with uh, what are, you know is a handful of people at the end of the day. Like you know we're well funded, we have. 30 odd folks who work full time on ASP.NET Core and then a whole bunch more who work on .NET Core, um, but it's still finite. And you know, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, we're not a hundred billion dollar company that's making .NET Core. We're, <laughs> we're a much, much smaller group of people right. who are working on .NET Core um, and Visual Studio and all the rest of it. And the reality is the team is not much bigger, if any bigger than it was 10 years ago when we started doing open source you know, and when we did MVC um, and NuGet. 
And we mm -hmm. didn't have VS Code to support. We didn't have Linux and Mac to support. <clears throat> but it's just something you can't throw people at this. No, like do, some th hey, some do things you, wanna, you can. Do you want to not share the screen? Can anymore? you switch back? Oh yeah, yeah sure. Oh uh, yep. Yeah. Let's go there back go. here. I think that would be. There we go. So yeah, it, it is. It, it, this is a thing that we constantly live with on the team, which any software team should or does, I hope, which is, you know, it, it's always a question of trade-offs. It's always a question of what's the cost now, what's the cost over time, um, mm -hmm. and then what is the opportunity cost of either doing it now or not doing it now, um, and then what's the benefit, right? It's, it's yeah, cost, 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 benefit is the way I kind of think about it. You've got the cost now, the cost over the long term, the opportunity cost of doing it or not doing it, and then the benefit of all the, uh, against those three things. Um, and that's just, and sometimes it doesn't line up. It's going to, you know, it's going to frustrate some people because something is a benefit to someone, to, to you, but it's not a benefit to the wider uh, group that we're serving. And as such, it's not worth the, the three costs elements that we identify. And that will annoy some folks. And that's just the reality of anyone building product. I guess it's not even just software. So yeah, it, it's great. These type of things I think help because they let people, you know, invest a small amount of time with some structured um, material, which is also really important because the internet is a fire hose and it's hard to get a nice thread through that to learn something quickly. So having a, a series of structured content is useful. Um, and then they can make that decision for themselves. Um, that's a long way of saying it was great. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so I wanted to comment on that going, going back to something that initially maybe you didn't think you needed a new feature or language feature or whatever it is, uh, because a lot of the time you don't know what you don't know, right? So if you never viewed it initially, uh, you'll never know to go back to it or search for it. So I find it very useful to, when something new comes out, just to browse it. I don't have to understand the whole thing. And uh, I don't know about you guys, but I never remember anything. So if I want to write to hmm. a text file, I don't, like I have to look it up. And sometimes I find my own blog post, I find my own code, which is fine. Uh, but I'm able to search for something that I know to search for because I've seen it before. So again, when a new language feature comes out, I want to know when it's out first. Uh, just so that it's in the back of my head somewhere, and that way I know to come back to it later on. Yeah, I like to kind of keep that, you know, I think of something, like they have the Gartner graph or whatever, and there's like with all those things, it's like technology, it's like, okay, this thing's out here, let me take two minutes, skim a page, okay, I vaguely know where it fits in at least, and, and it, you know what I mean? I know I can find right. this in the future. And then later as stuff gets more, closer to shipping or more is it likely that I'll need to use it. Then I, you know, like over time kind of what page faulted in or whatever. It's funny you mentioned that, John. I often tell folks to, you know, the ThoughtWorks tech radar or technology mm -hmm. radar is an incredibly valuable resource. If you just want like the reader's digest of the titles of tech that I probably should be interested in or should just, you know, have to make a decision on whether I go deeper I, from a wider point of view, like within one ecosystem mm -hmm. like .NET, doesn't help you much. And maybe someone should build the .NET tech radar so that you can, you know, it has that nice, you know, quadrant of like, should I adopt now? Should I look at now? Should I drop it now? That would be great for .NET. Someone who was in, who can do an informed, you know, we shouldn't do it because we're just Microsoft will <laughs> just tell you, but like, it'd be nice to have someone with a, a different a, a opinion and more informed approach in the real world, uh, do something like that. But the, the technology radar from ThoughtWorks, I find particularly useful. I tend to check it every quarter. Um, to see what they're saying about emerging technologies, legacy technologies, you know, when it's time to evaluate something, when it's time to adopt something, when it's time to let something go, um, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, yeah, I find those type of analyst things super useful. Mm -hmm. I always joke about my resume being multiple pages and then how I have to yank out the middle part of the resume. You have to get used to being able to do that. Like I had a three page resume, page two, just yank it out, right? Yeah. Like. Back in the early 90s, early 2000s, rather, you wanted to scale a web farm, I was your guy. Now it's a checkbox, fine, rip that page of the resume out. And if you don't accept that, like that's a, that's a thing that you're going to have to give up, then you're going to have problems. Yeah, absolutely. So looking at the Gartner quadrants is a good way to decide which part of your resume to throw out the door. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, unless that's something you really want to go deep on. There's someone who works at the cloud companies who implements that for the millions who now don't have to worry about it, but that's now a very specialist thing, right? It is a checkbox, like you said, there's a lot of code behind that checkbox and you could, if you want to write that code, right. you know, come away so, from Microsoft. Remember we used to talk about our friends, the IT department at Little Debbie Snack Cakes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Are they really the world's foremost experts at scaling web farms? If they are, great, that's amazing. They should write books and do seminars. If not, they should focus on snack cakes 
and let somebody else do the checkbox. And that, that's funny because that's been the argument that I've heard in tech marketing for literally decades. It's just that the sort of the watermark about where that is has moved over time because it used to be normal to run your own email server. And then people were like, why are you running your own email server? Like, it, but it took a while well, so, for that to but, happen. But then validity there is some valid arguments. There are privacy and, you know, oh, I, absolutely. But total, I mean, I've still got a Synology and I run my own servers at home here, but I don't run my own email servers. Right. But I would argue that most of those things come down to more personal views and alignments with certain philosophies rather than business need. Yeah, exactly. It's a Buy a car, different... build a car from scratch in yeah, your farm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So. Cool. Uh, one one other thing, Shahed, is you work at Microsoft. What is what is your role? Because you actually are working with customers, right? On some That's of right. Stuff. Uh, so I started out as uh, one of the tech evangelists for the old DX group, and uh, all of us, or at least most of us, have been uh, swallowed into this massive CSC or commercial software engineering organization. And uh, our full time job is to listen to customers. Uh, in different industry sectors. So I'm specifically aligned around retail. And uh, we sit with them to hear about what their problems are, their journey to the cloud, and how we can accelerate uh, what they do in Azure and things that they've never thought of. So not, it's only not only just lift and shift, but also expanding uh, the capabilities of what they can do. Uh, so I work with both retailers and vendors, uh, everything from uh, .NET applications, uh, an app service to Azure Functions, uh, SQL DB spanning like different countries people are working with. So all things Azure with uh, all sorts of technologies you can imagine. And any fun like .NET Core stuff? Do you have any early adopters that you get to work with on some? Uh, of yeah, there, there's actually, uh, so uh, when, I'll, I can explain it more when it's live, but I can say there's uh, a couple of major retailers I've been working with. Uh, they started with .NET where they had some SharePoint developers who had .NET experience and they're wondering what else they could do with that experience. So I did a workshop with them just to learn about ASP.NET Core from scratch. A lot of them hadn't touched MVC. Uh, so again, a lot of it was new and uh, they got the firehose of MVC, Blazor and everything, the stuff that was coming mm -hmm. and stuff that's out now, stuff that, that missed over the years. And uh, within a few months, they had their first prototype up uh, running, running live in Azure with ASP.NET Core, uh, with SQL Server Database and uh, they're, you know, they're they're going to go. Uh, they're live right now in their staging servers, but they're going into production uh, by the end of the year. Wow. Yep. Very cool. Um. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, so I, I don't know, um, Damien, if you wanted to talk about oh, anything. I have heaps to talk about. Actually, I've just got two bullet points I want to talk about. <laughs> but it's been it's been a while. So if you'll all uh, bear with me, I wanted to, to chat about a couple of things. Um, we could talk about laptops, but you know that usually just descends into madness and me yelling at people. Can we the state can of we talk about my new ring light? We can. Can I do this first, and then we can no. do that? Okay. Yes. Because <laughs> you do look really good today. I have to say. <laughs> All right. So I have been, you know, have not been on the show for a while. Obviously, a lot's happened with the release since then. Uh, dot. Net Core Preview 7, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, blah, 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 was the one that I think it's the current one. Preview 8 is now in sort of final throes of being uh, of being shut down. I think we're taking, when I left yesterday, they were looking to take one more build because there was a couple of fixes that came in yesterday. And then Preview 8 will be done and it will get released, I think it's next Tuesday, um, along with the next update of Visual Studio. Uh, Visual Studio Preview, that is, because uh, as you probably know, 3.0 of .NET Core is aligned with 16.3 of Visual Studio for Windows, and so they're they're shipping in lockstep because there's so much new tooling and MS Buildy stuff and Razor stuff. So we have to kind of we've chosen to dovetail those together. Um, and so and there are Preview 9 builds. So if, if you're using nightly builds today, um, it, it had changed a bit recently because some of the team has moved on to .NET 5 work already, like Master of the .NET Core or CLR and Core FX repos has already moved uh, to .NET 5 work so that we could free up the community to make contributions to the next major version because we're kind of in lockdown now for .NET Core 3. So where we're at is Preview 7 had a go live license, which is encouraging folks uh, to, you know, to de deploy it in production and, and you'll get support from Microsoft support if you need, if you need that. Um, and if we find, you know, critical issues or security issues, we'll issue a, 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 an update to that very quickly, as quick as we can. Um, the uh, preview eight, as I said, will be out next week. There are, there's a body of work I know that's coming, uh, 
post preview seven. Some people say, well, does that mean it's not gonna change? There are some caveats. So Blazor still has a, a few large-ish, probably more medium areas that they're still nailing down. And so that you know there will be changes beyond preview seven for server-side Blazor that are beyond bug fix. Okay. What does, does that mean, the difference between this is on lockdown and then you say there's a bunch of stuff coming? So think, think of the, the .NET Core product is think of it as a stack or a cake where the base plate is like the .NET XE, the .NET I host, see, okay. right? And then there's all these layers up until like file new, the template code that gets spat out, right? Um, which each one of those has an impact yeah. on the Laser layer above it. Laser is frosting. Yeah, and Blazor's not frosting, you know, Blazor is kind of a little lower, like your app is probably the sprinkles on top of the frosting with this analogy. <laughs> um, but it means that, you know, we've, we, we've locked down Core CLR and Core FX pretty much and the, and the hosting layer already. They're basically, they're done and they're in servicing bar, which means they're not going to make a change unless something is bad enough that we would push it out as a patch, as a, as a released servicing patch, right? These are the different bug bars that we have. ASP.NET Core, EF Core, those framework level things. Um, the bar is slightly lower, but not a lot. So they're in what's called ask mode, which we've talked about on, on the standup before. So every change to those areas generally at the moment requires director level approval or ship room crew approval, which is basically a group of people that decide whether any code change can go in or not at this point, because the product is trying to get shut down. There are some areas of the product that have a a big tick to say, no, we've already pre-approved this body of 29 issues and you can go ahead and work on those and then check them in without letting us know. And there's some area, there's some stuff in MVC that's having that because a lot of the team has been focused on doing Blazor work. So they haven't been able to do MVC bug fixing. And so there's a body of MVC bugs that we wanted to fix in 3.0 because it's a major version and we couldn't really fix them in 2.2 or servicing of 2.1 because they may change behavior subtly, even though they're more correct. And so we can't do that in a patch because it may break applications, but we're going to do it in three. Um, so that will come in preview nine. Um, and then Blazor, as I mentioned, and then EF Core, because it's separate from .NET Core in regards, it's not in the shared framework, it's packages you opt into now. Um, they did this huge query engine rewrite, which only came out in preview seven. And so they are very late uh, in regards to that big breaking change. And so they're still reacting and churning quite a lot to get that query engine up to snuff to ship on the same timeline. But they're looking pretty good, last sync we have with them. So that's pretty cool. Um, and so some folks ask about, you know, well, what about RC? When's there going to be a release candidate? So preview seven is go live. You can use it in production with those caveats, right? There will be some changes to some parts, which, you know, it won't be super impactful, but you have to keep that in mind. If you wanted something that's closer to what you would call a traditional RC, I think it's more likely going to be preview nine, the preview nine build. And that's because of those bodies of pre-approved work that I've already talked about. It's two more releases after preview seven where Blazor can finish their lockdown, EF Core can finish their, their query stuff, and MVC can get a lot of those bugs fixed that they've been wanting to fix. So I think the preview nine build is going to be the one that looks closer to what most people would agree is a genuine release candidate, even though it won't be labeled a release candidate. If there is going to be a, a release after preview nine that isn't the the final release, it would actually be called RC because we can't do preview ten because that breaks the Semver sort ordering. Oh no! <laughs> um, and so we have to go from preview nine to some other alpha. Wait, Semver works with ten, doesn't why, it? No, why it doesn't. Don't we just because... not go beyond nine. Well, we could choose to just not go beyond nine, except remember we're dovetailed into Visual Studio. And we want for this release, and if there is going to be another preview release of that where we have to take a fix because of a change in Visual Studio, we will have to increment the version number because Semver and preview nine because we we put the nine in the same segment of the Semver suffix because we're stupid um, in hindsight as the alpha part. That part is only sorted oh. alpha numerically. It is not semantic. To get semantic sorting in the suffix, you have to have a period which we now do, that's Semver 2, right? And we have that for some, the build numbers are in that area, for example. Preview 9 to preview 10 doesn't work. But as someone, Nick, just said, preview dot 9 to preview dot 10 works. But we didn't do that at the beginning of 3.0 because we weren't building Semver 2 stuff at the beginning of 3.0. We only switched to Semver 2 version numbers in like preview 5. And, it, it, and for all, the, we haven't even done it for the whole stack yet. We only did it, I think, like the site extension, for example, for ASP.NET Core preview runtimes, it works in Azure App Service. That still isn't Semver 2 versioning because Azure App Service site extension gallery isn't using a new, ver new enough version of NuGet to support Semver 2 versions because everything's complicated. 
and nothing is ever simple. Everything's so much more complicated. Right, <laughs> than, it, than it sounds like. And so that's why. Anyway, so we won't do that. For .NET 5, we'll switch to full semver 2. We won't do preview 1. We'll do preview dot one or something, and then this problem will go away. It only takes us five versions to figure that out. Um, so that's happening. So if you really are waiting for an RC, um, I would probably preview 9 is going to be that one. Um, but honestly, if you're already updating your code, you know, week to week with this stuff, I, I, I would adopt it now and see what it looks like. And if it works for you, then I'd put a production and, and go for it. Um, the other big thing I wanted to call out was this blog post that just went live. Let me share my screen. Oh, look, no signal because that's the wrong one. Let me do that one. Um, so this blog post just went live today. This is one of the biggest changes that we've made with regards to how .NET Core is included and delivered with Visual Studio. Um, and it's, a, it's, a, it's the first step as part of a bigger change with, .NET, with the .NET SDK moving forward. This blog post went live this morning or last night uh, and it talks about this change. So now with you know, everyone who has used Visual Studio and .NET Core will be, will be familiar with the proliferation of .NET Core versions that they end up with on their machine. And you know, they go over to their favorite command and they type .NET info and like it scrolls for pages and pages, especially if they use two different versions of Visual Studio. You can see down here in the taskbar, I have two side-by-side -side instances installed. Um, for what it's worth, I am using, this one on the left is the public preview channel of Visual Studio. And the one on the right is the internal preview channel of Visual Studio. So this is stuff you haven't seen yet. And this is the one that you all have now for using the preview channel. I don't even have the the, you know, the public released channel installed because I have no use for it. I always want the preview channel, which is what you need for .NET Core 3, and I want the internal preview channel because that is the one that's closest to the internal master branch, which means that I can use the stuff that the developers checked in a couple of days ago, okay? And so this is the one that y'all will be getting uh, next week. And so uh, the point was in the old days, if you had both of these things installed, the release channel and the preview channel, you would by default get at least two versions of .NET Core, which makes sense because they both have their own. The problem was that any change to any part of .NET Core, a template, a core CLR, the host, ASP.NET Core, EF Core, anything would result in a new SDK. Um, also, any change to MS Build, any change to NuGet, and any change to the compiler, Roslyn, would result in a new SDK. Those SDKs installed side by side, which meant that any one of those components changed, you got a new side by side installation of .NET Core SDK, which means when you went to this screen, it just added at least one more line, if not three or four new lines, because this is listing both SDKs and runtimes or shared frameworks that are installed. The big change is that in VS Now from 16.3 onwards, you will only ever get one .NET SDK per channel of VS that you're installing. So I have two here, you can see them. I've got Preview 7 012821, which is the current Preview 7 build that everyone is using. And I have Preview 8 013437, which is the current build that is inserted into the internal dog fooding build of Visual Studio, which is very close to what will be released next week, if not is actually the one that will be released next week. And that's all I will ever have. I will only have two versions and they will just go up based on what's going on. Um, the runtimes underneath are now treated separately. So you will get a runtime with an SDK because the SDK needs a runtime to run itself on and it'll always be the latest runtime. Um, but then you will opt in to earlier runtimes. So in 16.3 preview one, we defaulted to just giving you the 3.0 runtime, preview seven, and the 3.0 SDK by default. And then you had to choose if you wanted the 2.1 runtime or the 2.2 runtime. Uh, based on feedback and using that, we've decided that in preview two or three or whatever it is onwards, of 16.3, we will always give you the LTS, current LTS runtime, which is still 2.1 today, and the latest current runtime by default for VS installs, all right? So you would get two runtimes, two versions, I should say. So that means you get the ASP.NET Core, the ASP.NET Core, all ASP.NET Core app and the .NET Core app runtimes for both of those versions. And you would just get the latest SDK because the latest SDK obviously allows you to target any version of .NET. That's the whole point. Just like VS, latest version lets you target any version of .NET. You, don't, you shouldn't have to have multiple versions of VS installed just to build for different versions of .NET, right? Obviously. Um, so that's what we're doing for the SDK. That makes it much, much, much simpler. And then as the SDK does have to change, it now defaults to uninstalling the previous version so that you don't get this proliferation of SDKs. Similarly for runtimes, as we update the runtimes with servicing, because we do roll forward automatically onto the latest patch for a given major minor 
um, pair of the runtime will uninstall the previous runtime for you um, when you install the new one or when it comes down through Visual Studio. Now, I'm talking about developer boxes here for people who are maintaining their production servers themselves. Like you, you do whatever you do, right? You, you know what you have on your machine. You know what you need to do to run the apps that you want on the actual version of the runtime you want. That's all on you. Al Installer has one behavior, but you should always be aware of what you're running on your production machines. I wouldn't ever dream that we could get the defaults right for everyone for how we get the production instances of runtimes and things installed. But for developer machines, we kind of have, you know, we kind of own the message here. We want to make sure that there's the least amount to run your stuff successfully um, in a developer machine and not have you have to maintain this stuff. Now, in the past, I had given some guidance on how to clean up these versions. And so I would tell folks to kind of go into, you know, you'd right mouse click down here, you go to apps and features, you'd uh, type in .NET Core, and you would see like 400 entries, right? Now notice there are none here at all. And we're still reevaluating this behavior, by the way. Um, and that's because the .NET Cores that are installed on my machine now are wholly managed by Visual Studio. I got them via Visual Studio. So if I were to allow you to uninstall them here, you could effectively break Visual Studio, unless you went and repaired Visual Studio through the installer, which you can always do, by the way, okay? Um, repair does work if we do it right. And so if you ever find yourself, you deleted a file on disk that you weren't supposed to because you're in program files and then VS dot doesn't work, go and repair VS and it'll fix itself. Um, so you don't see any of them in here anymore because we manage it for you as part of the VS um, stuff. Um, but in the old days, you would see a whole bunch of stuff here. I would tell you to uninstall everything that had .NET Core in it. Then I'd tell you to go to program files, delete the .NET folder because there was stuff in that folder that wasn't tracked by the installer for uninstall reasons, but was laid down by the installer. That's really bad, by the way. I'm sorry we did that. Um, and then I would tell you to just go and install the latest one. Um, you don't have to do that anymore. If you're using VS, you don't have to worry about that. If you don't use VS, if you're a VS Code user, and I know that there are tens of thousands of you out there who do that uh, on Windows and Mac and Linux, um, then you'll just do what you do today. You'll manage the .NET Core SDK yourself. You'll run the installer. If you're really um, uh, kind of custom, you'll download the zips and the archives and you'll do it yourself. And then I, I have no advice for you. Do whatever you want because you've obviously decided to do that. But if you're using the installers, we're trying to make this much better for you now. So um, I'd love to get feedback about this. The whole team would love to get feedback about this change because it is a very, very large change. Um, so please do read the blog post that Lee published uh, last night uh, slash this morning. And if you've had any issues, uh, please let us know. I noticed some folks in the in the comments here have put their hands up already in the chat saying, yeah, I did that. I deleted my .NET folder because you told me to a year ago and it broke my VS this week. Um, you can just repair VS and it will fix itself. This is new. And as I said, we are reevaluating this to see if there's a way we can sort of get the best of both worlds. But there you go. There is a question. What happens if you don't use Visual Studio? I think I just addressed that, didn't I? If you don't mm -hmm. use Visual Studio, you will install, as usual, the .NET Core SDK. You can still download the .NET Core SDK separately and install it, and it will then appear in the Add Remove programs or what's it called now, programs and features. And then if you uninstall Visual Studio, you'll still have the SDK because you installed it separately and those two things ref count correctly and it won't delete it from your machine, right? So if you want to main, you know, control your own destiny with regards to .NET Core SDKs, you can still just download any version and install it. That's totally fine, right? You can still do that. Don't worry about that. Uh, the other thing is we're working on a new Windows.NET installer, which is in this future enhancements uh, section, which I've talked, which uh, I've seen. It's looking really good. There's a couple of things, reasons for that. One is the installer tech that we're using today is an old version of Wix. It doesn't support high DPI, which is a little embarrassing because .NET Core 3 includes WinForms and WPF, and our own installer doesn't render in high DPI, <laughs> which kind of irks me. Um, but it was a huge effort to change that, and so that wasn't able to happen for 3.0. But we have an investment now to write a custom installer that is doing that. Um, and also make it more like kind of the VS world, where you don't want to manage every single installation of .NET Core separately, generally. You just kind of want an installer that then says, hey, these are the runtimes you have installed. These are the SDKs you have installed. There's an update for this one. There's an update for that one. And you can just hit like go, right? So we are working on that installer tech. And again, that it, and, and that's designed for running on Windows Server as well. So if you have full IS and you need to manage the versions of the ASP.NET Core module, um, all that type of stuff can be managed from the one installer and you don't have to go to the download site and go, oh, look, it's a page of links. Which one do I need for my machine again? You'll just download the one .NET Core Windows installer. It'll boot up and go, oh, it looks like you're running on Windows Server. You probably need these things, right? Oh, it looks like you've got a version of Visual Studio. You should do this instead, right? So we want to make it easy, obviously, to, 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 for folks to get .NET on their machine 
and have that managed in the most appropriate way, keep it up to date, all that type of stuff. All right, they were the two things I was gonna talk about and I see a bunch of questions now, which I'm happy to dive into quickly. I saw someone ask about uh, benchmarks. So the latest on benchmarks is we do have a PR out on the official Tech and Power repo right now, which is using Preview 7. Uh, all the tests pass, uh, they're showing the improvements that we expect to see. Uh, so that'll either get merged this week or we'll just wait for Preview 8 to drop next week. Then we'll update the P PR for Preview 8 and then we'll submit that. So you'll see the ASP.NET core entries in Tech and Power continuous results move onto the 3.0 uh, stuff and you'll see some you know, improvements there, which is great. Uh, there's some other stuff going on in Benchmarks. We're still uh, trying to get our hardware updated from 10 gig to 40 gig. Uh, we had our breakthrough, finally had our breakthrough on that in this last week where we finally got a Linux box, one of our Linux servers and one of the Windows servers successfully talking to each other over the 40 gigabit uh, NICs over the existing switch that we have. And we were able to do one successful test run of doing a load test of the plain text platform benchmark on Windows. And we managed to go from six and a half million to 8.3 million requests per second, uh, just to prove that the network really was our bottleneck. The wrinkle in that is that there was a Linux kernel CVE patch that was released in June, which when we apply to our Linux load generator server, pegs us back down to the six and a half million again. And so now we're at the point where when we're trying to go beyond 10 gigabits per second, not only are we up against the network limit, which we're addressing with new hardware, but there was this kernel patch that we don't fully understand the implications of yet on Linux um, that is, seems to be preventing us from going beyond that as well. And so Tech and Power saw that as well when they updated all their Linux servers with this kernel patch a couple of weeks ago. Um, it basically, from my very rudimentary understanding, it does increase the CPU usage for anything doing networking. And so what we saw is that cluster of results at the top of the Tech and Power benchmarks for plain text has started to separate again because those frameworks that were already using a lot of CPU when the patch was in, in put in place, they started to drop, right? No longer were they limited by the network bandwidth, they're taking more CPU and they weren't able to do the numbers they were doing before. Whereas those that were um, not particularly CPU sensitive, there was one written, I think it's ULib that's written in C++ that is particularly very efficient uh, from a CPU point of view. It maintained its performance even after the kernel patch. The wrinkle in all that is that we observed the results going down just when we applied the patch to the load server, not even to the app server where all this code is running. So we're still not really sure what's going on yet. So we're still, you know, performance testing turns out like everything is really hard to get consistently right. So we're looking at that. Um, what else? The EF Core preview, the EF Core engine, the new engine in EF Core 3 that went out in preview 7, that isn't as fast yet as the old engine. We confirmed that when we switched the benchmarks over for Preview 7, but it's actually nowhere near as bad as folks were expecting because they hadn't actually got to doing any perf work yet. It's only a, a fairly small drop. Um, and you know, in, in some arguments, the trade-off and correctness of the new engine would be well worth the drop that we've seen already and they haven't even started doing perf work yet. So that was really encouraging to see as well. Um, we got a whole bunch of stuff fixed on the dapper was broken for a long time. The test, we got that stuff fixed. Um, and DAP is still looking really good on EF, on Core 3, I should say. Um, we have some work scheduled for the next three to six months to really go after the Fortunes benchmark, which is the database and HTML rendering benchmark. The big bottleneck for us there right now is that the top frameworks have implemented database driver pipelining, which is the at the database driver level, they actually pipeline requests um, uh, seamlessly under the covers for you. You don't have to do anything about it, a little bit like HTTP pipelining. And so then they send them serially and then the other side, the database will support sending those back serially as well. We don't have that in ADO.net yet, but we have now scheduled work to implement that. And so we hope that that's gonna push our fortunes test up into that top echelon um, of tests again, which would be great. Cause we were there, we hit the like number seven, I think in round 16 or 17 or something. And then this new technique of pipelining in databases, database drivers got a green lit for the benchmarks and then we haven't implemented that yet. So we're gonna do that work. Uh, so that's probably the latest on the frameworks stuff. And the, I mean, obviously we we continue to try and push other stuff down. There was an update in this last week, which we don't fully understand yet, um, that dropped our Linux memory use for the plain text middleware benchmark. Not the plain text platform, not the crazy one, but like full ASP.NET Core with DI and middleware and everything. Plain text was using uh, was getting a working set of 100 megabytes, which is you know, crazy because in 2.2 it was like 1.2 gig. 
And in 3.0, it's 100 megabytes because we've done so much work on the GC and the allocations in ASP.NET Core. That went down to like 74 megabytes this week. So we got like a 25% reduction. And you don't know how? We don't know how, yeah. And could it have been some app to update some? No, it was actually, we verified that it wasn't anything to do with .NET Core. So our assumption is that it actually is to do with that CVE. And because of the nature and because of the tolerances and the weird interplay with latency and throughput, we think mm. that the there was a reduction in latency somewhere in the processing <coughs> of the network on the server now as the way it's coming in from the load server, which resulted in less uh, thread queue length in the application, which thus Therefore resulted in memory. which thus resulted in less concurrent requests actually being run in the application at any one point in time, which thus resulted in less memory. The throughput is the same. It's just that we're in each individual request is now being processed more quickly, but the load server can't generate more right. anyway, so the memory just goes down, right? So if the buffer sense. is less. Yeah, I mean, so like, and anyone who's ever done like in-depth performance testing knows that there's this really weird relationship between latency and queuing and CPU use and memory use, and, and it all depends on stuff. And it's never as easy as one goes up, the other goes down. Like it all depends on an interplay. But in this case, we didn't really do anything, but the memory went down, which is great, which is really good. Um, and also lock contention went down massively on our, I think it, what was it, the JSON test? One of them. And so that the Linux performance is now starting to converge with our Windows performance, which is something that we've also been working on because the Windows implementation of the .NET networking stack is you know 20 years old and has been improved over that time, whereas the Linux one is like four years old uh, and got rewritten in 2.1. Um, and so there's still you know a whole bunch of work we're doing there. Also, the thread pull implementation is different. Um, and so we continue to do that work to try and get the Linux numbers to converge with the Windows numbers. And so that work is ongoing. So that, that's, that's all going the right way, which is fantastic. Um, what else? Any other questions there that are, is worth uh, addressing while we're here? Mm. Why aren't I you was, using I was gonna Windows say, Terminal? I, I am using, I Windows, had a couple I am using Windows Terminal. That's Windows Terminal. Oh, well, your fonts are ugly then. Oh my gosh. Can you, uh, <laughs> can you tell me what I should be doing? This is just the default. This is Consalus, isn't it? Oh, it's just the default. I think it's Consalus. All right, I'll send you the new one. We're making a new one called Cascadia Code. Okay. And it's lovely. Really? It's custom. How do I choose? And you know about the control scroll and the shift control scroll features? No. So go over to the thing, to the, uh, to the, um, go over to the, yeah, there, and then control scroll. Okay. Oh, oh, nope. Okay, hang on. Okay, so I can zoom in and out. Okay, and then if you have control shift scroll, it'll change the transparency if you have acrylic on, and then you can have stuff underneath it. Uh, I don't see transparency. So then if you go back to your settings, there's an option that says use acrylic. Use acrylic. So what's the name of the one you're in right now? The name of what, sorry? The profile? Uh, so go back, yeah, the profile that you're currently in. I'm in whatever my default profile is, which I think is PS Core. Okay, so, so then control F Core. Uh, or it's the other machine that is PowerShell. Core. There you go. See where it says use acrylic on line 240? I love line numbers. It is false. So hit that to true and then okay. just save and then alt tab back. Ooh. Now hit control shift scroll. I can see it's transparent now. Yeah. Uh, it, and, oh, yeah. Okay. So you can Did set it delay? to taste. Yeah. And now you need an animated GIF, right? And then, <laughs> then you go and make animated GIF reactions based on error levels of .NET builds. Ah. Plus, if you use Bash or or parts of PowerShell, you can have Powerline and um, use Glyphs. How do you have the time? And you can have ligature. I do it when the kids are asleep. <laughs> I go to sleep when the kids are asleep. My kids tend to <laughs> fall asleep after me, which is really I'll sleep when I'm dead. Okay, fair mm -hmm. enough. Well, I am using virtual probably. desktops again, though. Ooh. Ah, nice. Um, All right, then then I'll show you the new Power Toy stuff we're doing, so you can well, have Well, there's maximized... no build of that yet. I know I want that. That's yeah. the feature no, I'm I'll missing. I'll get you that. So maximize to virtual desktop. Yes, we'll that's what I want. That's exactly the thing I'm missing. Yeah, working on that. Okay, very cool. Uh, okay, what do we got? Anything there that uh, <laughs> anything worth answering? Uh, I don't know. I gotta Let's go. We are, I mean, up, we're an hour up. in, so uh... yeah, yeah. Someone did That's ask what's good. happening in .NET 5. Nothing. Yeah. Uh, .NET 5 planning has just started, other than what you know, uh, Hunter already announced earlier this year as the general direction of .NET 5, 1.NET unification, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so yeah, there's a few working groups set up, and we're just doing really, really early stuff. We'll have more to share about that after our summer. Like, there's no one here. Like It's August. Like The, car, yeah. the park, car, parking lot is quiet. The traffic is quiet. 
um, this is when we start doing planning usually. So there was a question too about core RT with .NET five. Yeah, no, no plans for core RT. Core, core RT is still you know experimental. If the repo says it, the repo says it quite clearly, it's experimental, unfunded. Um, there's some good learnings in core RT. Core RT has a different implementations for some of the core pieces like the thread pool. And we still look to, because it was an opportunity to write a lot of that stuff from scratch. Um, and there are still pieces of the core IT runtime that we pull over to core CLR um, when we have an opportunity to, and it makes sense. Um, and I know for .NET 5, some folks are thinking about taking the core IT thread pool implementation and moving that into core CLR. The biggest cost there is actually just testing and making sure that we haven't uh, regressed any specific scenarios with that new implementation, but we know it has benefits for some scenarios we care about. So. That would be uh, super interesting. Uh, one other question is just a uh, or, or reminder, I guess, from the chat. But .NET Conf coming up. Make sure to submit your talk. Make sure to register your live events. .NET Conf .NET coming up in September. Awesome. All right. Well, All right. I guess that's a good spot to wrap up. Yeah. Uh, thank you again to Shahed. I mean, awesome book. Um, the links in the in the chat and will be in the show notes for the videos and keep doing amazing stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Right, I have to push a button, don't I? Okay. You do. See everybody. No, hang on. Oh, hang on. wait, wait, wait. Hang what? on. Hang on. Are we no longer zooming out? We, we don't have to zooming zoom out since we did the, since we well, moved to the studio. We need a digital zoom out or some. We've superior. said that forever. I mean, James, if you're watching, like get on it. Like everything's worked really it's smoothly, not, but we still have no same. zoom out. Without um, zooming out. It, there must be an OBS filter or something we can get that just like zooms out the whole. All right. Thing. Maybe one Let's of the. That's a high priority. One of the community people can help us for that. I, I would appreciate it. Return <laughs> of the zoom. Someone start a hashtag and we'll we'll get a trend going. Absolutely. All right. All right. Sweet. <laughs> Thanks, everyone. See you later. All right. Bye. Thanks again. <laughs> Thanks, Scott. <laughs>